mention it here that my literature students are currently reading a couple of translated short stories originally written by Isma Chuktai under the Studies in World Literature 20th Century Hindi Urdu Fiction course at North Carolina State University. English translations of these stories were taken from the book Isma Chuktai, Lifting the Veil, Selected Writings, translated by Mr. M. Asauddin, originally from Assam. Uh, during this course, I have been continuously bringing parallel narratives of literary history and cultures of the state of Assam. Since I'll be creating Assamese literary and folk uh, folklore related courses to offer our undergraduate students at this university, I felt like to encourage my students um, to do further studies and research, especially on Assam. It is the best time to hear from a great writer critic from this land of Red River and Blue Hills. I have invited, that's why I have invited Mr. Mayur Bora to give a speech on the topic, the glory of Assam and Assamese. And uh, he will be lifting up the veil of the Northeastern literature and cultures of the Indian subcontinent. Thank you very much for accepting my request and agreeing to present your thoughts to my students. Now let me tell you about Mr. Moyu Bora. Mr. Bora um, is an Indian writer, critic, and public speaker from Assam, northeast part of India. He was born in Nogao, Assam, grew up in Guwahati, and for college education, he went to Delhi University, completed his degree majoring in history and minoring in philosophy. Even though he worked as a banker for 25 years, Mr. Bora took voluntary retirement from the job to pursue his passion of reading and writing. Bora has 16 books to his credits, 14 in Assamese language, one in English, and one translated work. He's a bilingual columnist, critic in most of the newspapers of Assam. He has written the burning issues of Assam in national and international newspapers. He's also a regular panelist of Indian national talk shows. Um, he has delivered speeches in more than 70 colleges and universities. For his work in the field of literature, Mr. Bora has been conferred with many prestigious awards. We are really fortunate to have you today in our Zoom session. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today. Please welcome Mr. Moyur Bora. But in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, Please write it in the chat box and towards the end of the session, the floor will be open for all of the question and answers. Uh, please mm, uh, mute yourself and, uh, and for everyone, please uh, turn on your computer, uh, turn on your cameras so that we can have a really nice conversation. Uh -huh. Please welcome Mr. Moyur Bora. Thank you, Dr. Fugan. Uh, I thought I will say you either good afternoon to all the students of and other people who have joined from uh, the glorious university called the North Carolina State University. But I heard many of your students greeting each other and greeting their teacher, their favorite teacher with namaste. So I am also tempted to use that namaste to all of them and also not deprive me of the pleasure and temptation of wishing them good afternoon. Uh, it's pretty late here uh, in my home state of Assam, uh, in the far uh, northeastern part of India. That's around 1,200 miles from Delhi. And the financial capital of India is Mumbai. From Mumbai, Guwahati is situated at a distance of around, say, 15 to 1,600 miles. First of all, uh, Dr. Fukun, I can start, right? I am starting straight away. Okay, and I hope I am audible, uh, uh, the students and you can hear me. In case of any issues, technical issues, I think Dr. Fukun and uh, Mr. Klein will be kind enough to inform me in between. And now presuming that everyone has been able to hear me properly, I am just proceeding, first of all, with a gratitude, with an abiding sense of gratitude to Dr. Nilashi Fukun for being very instrumental and for being uh, very kind and gracious enough to have invited me to deliver a lecture before the 
before the intellectually vibrant students of North Carolina State University who are some way or the other associated with studies in world literature with special emphasis on South Asian literature and Dr. Fukun herself being a erudite scholar of Hindi, having done her PhD in Hindi, that is the not the national language, but official language of India. I think uh, she might have talked to most of her students about different uh, genres of Hindi literature. But as you know, India is a very diverse country. We have got many languages recognized by our constitution, not to speak of the dialects and all. Uh, so I will be talking mostly about Assam and Assamese. And you know, Assam and Assamese means that northeastern part of India to which actually doc your favorite teacher, Dr. Nilakshi Fukun belongs. And I also belong to that slice of geography. And I am again, very, very thankful to Dr. Fukun and other authorities of North Carolina State University for having given me this opportunity. I'd also like to take this privilege of thanking Mr. Bob Klein. I think without whose support for the technical, probably I would not been, have been able to talk to you sitting in a place maybe around 8,000 miles away from you, from North Carolina and Assam in the Northeastern part of India. So I thank all of them. And I'm tempted to compare the both the glorious, the beautiful countries, the United States of America and India. And anyone, any world leader, he may be a thought leader, he may be an intellectual, he may be an artist. I think most of them will be, most of them will be saying when they talk about India and United States of America, they will talk about the democratic ethos. USA being the flag bearer of democratic tenets and ethos after their that uh, American war of independence, the drafting of American declaration Washington becoming the first president and uh, succeeded by different presidents with the president, Mr. Biden. And now we know that our prime minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, also has been to United States of America just three, four days back. He returned to India only last, uh, I think, day, yesterday. But why I am telling about the politicians are not very important, but the important fact is that when we talk about democracy, we also talk about democratic tenets and ethos. We also talk about the implicit ideas of diversity and pluralism for which United States of America is best known in this world. Everyone, everyone appreciates, everyone salutes USA for their military power, for their financial power. But I feel as a, as a student, as a student of human behavior and other aspects of other aspects of society and all. I think my students here, they, you will agree that United States of America, one of the most important reason for being the most important country in the world is because of the fact that America has already always been cherishing and celebrating diversity and pluralism. And that has been the DNA of American democracy. And same is the case, India being, a, India being a nascent democracy in comparison to USA, we became independent only in 1947, whereas USA we know in 1776. So there is, a, there is a gap of around 150, 160 years. But even then, we are tempted to remember, we are tempted to uh, compare that United States of America and India, they are two Today's, in today's world, one, two of the largest democracies of the world. And when we say largest democracy, democracy is always strengthened. They're always, always being invigorated by the people who inhabit that geography which celebrates democracy. And for that reason, United States of America and India, I think there are a lot of, lot of similarities. And you know, when we talk about diversity and pluralism, there may be some differences also. It is, it is said, it is very rightly said, uh, one scholar said some time back that it is always our similarities that bring people together. But if you want to remain together, I think your differences are very important. My differences with Dr. Nilakshi Fukun would be very, very significant in sustaining our intellectual friendship. We can discuss, we can, we can, we can debate, we can, we can have divergent opinion on issues. And at the same time, we can conclude and we can have a cup of tea at the end of the day. 
and why i am mentioning about the cup of tea i think you will come to know because when we talk about tea somehow the name of assam and assam especially the land of assam gets equated or maybe the two sides of the same coin is one side if you will find assam on the other side you will find assam tea i was i was uh, with lot of interest i was watching when dr nilakshi fukan was interacting informally with her students i remember having seen a student fleetingly maybe for 5 seconds and he was holding a cup i am tempted to believe if he doesn't say now that it was not tea i let me go with the belief that he was having tea and when you have tea somehow as an assamese sitting in assam i feel as if we are creating a bonding we are creating a kind of friendship without pr probably knowing each other because i don't say that tea is produced only in assam but assam is mostly known for tea and more than 50% of india's tea is produced in assam and when we talk about assam assam is a very small small slice of geography within india in terms of area but in terms of many other things in terms of hospitality in terms of some amount of camaraderie and bond homey with people there will be bad people everywhere in every geographies in assam also you will find but even then i will i will tempted to say that assam is known for that incredible sense of hospitality despite not being geographically very very big we have been able because we have been endowed by nature to produce tea which is known for its aroma for its strength and for for its a very different kind of peculiar characteristic which any tea lover will be very, very i think they will be very uh, happy or they will be very easily able to appreciate that but it is very difficult to define but that tea and assam that connection has been there for the last 200 years or maybe 250 years when british i am sure dr fukan when you talk about history when you talk about literature all your students would be well aware of the fact that india became independent only in 1947 before that for more than 200 years we were under the great britain united kingdom or great britain and during that point of time when british was occupying this land called india and assam being a part of that credit goes to some of the local assamese entrepreneurs as well as some of the uh, some of the visionary british leaders who could find that a peculiar kind of uh, peculiar kind of uh, what do you, what do you say uh, uh, that tea tea leaf or tea, typical kind of leaf which has been which has been drunk by the local people it was been found by uh, british and they tried to compare compare this with something which they have also seen or some of their friends have seen in china and after a lot of research after a lot of discussion on that after many years maybe after 2 3 decades they have come to a conclusion that i am not going to the scientific name of it but they came to a conclusion that assam tea is also a different variety of tea and as you know europe and the western world they got acclimatized with tea only 4 500 years back but chinese people and some of the people in india maybe some of the assamese they were associated and they knew about tea they drank tea for quite some time which 500 years back got introduced to the western world so i am not saying that assam tea is the best tea in the world but the fact that assam today is known for its tea that's why i wanted to i wanted to collectively reminisce collectively remember with all your students and other people who have joined this class that assam and tea they are two sides of the same coin not for all technical reasons but but for different kind of uh, uh, what you call virtual reasons it technically you can always find fault with the theory that a state or a geography cannot be associated only with a beverage called tea but for all practical purposes i think assam and tea are intertwined closely interconnected with each other and that's why i think i thank uh, dr fukan for showing this beautiful assam tea that she has presented she to all the care to present before us the tea and how people are working in the tea field and how ultimately how with lot of toil lot of lot of uh, labor and all ultimately we get our beverages 
in the morning or when we go to a restaurant or when we go to the North Carolina State University canteens, I'm sure you'll be having a lot of canteens where people have a lot of fun and much more fun before the COVID pandemic came two years back. At that, that point of time, I'm sure tea is a drink which has been universally liked and uh, drunk by most of the people, most of the students. And I think people say that it can be a very, very invigorating drink. So that is the link with tea and Assam. Secondly, I, I am tempted to remember what Irish scholar uh, dramatist George Barnard so said. I was, I was harping on diversity. I was harping on pluralism and why diversity and pluralism are, are the engines, are the driving force of democracy and why those things are very, very important. So it was, it was something uh, uh, ZB saw statement, ZB saw like your Mark Twain of United States of America and also Oscar Wilde. This three troika, this triumvirate are known for their very, very witty statesmen. They apparently, it seems very, very witty, but it has got a lot of meanings which can make us think about some of the very important and serious issues of the world. ZB saw once very famously said that America and England are two countries separated by a single language, by a common language. And he was harping on how people speak English differently. See, how I speak English sitting in Assam, how Dr. Fukan speaks English, although she was from Assam, she has been there for 20 years, and how some of the people who were born in USA and have the pleasure and privilege of going to a premier university called North Carolina State University, their accent, intonation, their diction will be different. And that is why I think ZB saw statement that England and America are two countries separated by a common language has got many meanings for everyone. And that diversity, the linguistic diversity, cultural diversity, diversity in cuisine, diversity in thought process, provided it is buttressed by rationality, it is buttressed by arguments, solid arguments, then I think we must try to debate it out. We have to discuss all those things in a democracy. And America, why I'm harping on democracy? Because America may be the flag bearer of this democratic ethos in the world. But I will, I would like, love to go a step further and say most of the American universities are even, they are the better flag bearers of those democratic tenets. I think that is one of the, one of the greatest feeder in the educational institutes of United States of America in general. And I'm very sure I have got no reason to have any kind of contrarian opinion about the university in which virtually I am, I am having the present pleasure and privilege of giving a lecture that is North Carolina State University. So as a university with cherishes and uh, divergence of opinion, diversity and pluralism in thoughts, now let me come back to some of the, some of the history, some of the things for which Assam is known. And when we talk about, see, uh, Nilakshi has been very kindly, she has been presenting different slices of history, some of the historical monuments of Ronghor, where the Ahom kings around, when it was built around three, 400 years back, the right-hand side top, that uh, house in which the kings came and they enjoyed some of the games being played in the field. There can be different kinds of games, which probably today, animal rights activists would not have allowed. But medieval India, medieval Assam, medieval USA was a different ball game. It was a different kind of culture. It was a different kind of thought process. So during that point of time, many animals fought and many of the no nobility and the kings and all the, all the senior bureaucrats of that point of time, they enjoyed it. So this is the beautiful amphitheater in Sipsagar that is around 300 kilometers away, 350 kilometers away from Gohati, which is the capital of Assam which Dr. Nilakshi Fukan is showing. Now, when we talk about Assam, in some of the mythological uh, documents, mythological scriptures, which probably Dr. Fukan might have told and some of you might have already come across, suppose Mahabharata. The Ramayana and Mahabharata are two defining epics for which India or Indians are known all throughout the world. In this Mahabharata, you will find a king called Bhagadatta, Bhagadatta participated, Bhagadatta took part in that famous war of Kurukshetra and he fought 
on behalf of the korobos why i have brought this suddenly going back from history to mythology little bit because historicity is not beyond doubt that's why i am telling it is a legend or a or a some sort of mythology but even then since many people have been celebrating this since many people have been reading this not only in india but other parts of the world including universities in united states that's why i am telling this bhagadatta was a king from assam i mean to say virtually i just try to connect you to that period of time which is probably maybe 2700 years ago if at all it's a historical fact if it is a mythological figure you cannot relate it to any time frame it is it is the imagination of some poet or writer but we since we do not know let us give them a benefit of doubt and for our limited purpose of this class let me have the pleasure of saying that bhagadatta as we read in mahabharata was a was a figure from assam about whom or about which we are talking now but if we come back to history if we come back to history i always say and today also i'd like to reiterate the first historical character of assam or rather if i want to say first historical assamese char character was a woman i think this is a this is a uh, i don't say this is this this can be a uh, what you call a robust template of feminism it is only an incidental fact but as far as my limited knowledge of history of the land to which i belong goes it tells me in unequivocal terms in very clear terms the first historical figure of assam was a lady her name was amrit prabha and we came to know about her from the accounts of kalhan who is a very famous historian in other parts of india that is kashmir and kalhan's raj tarangini is a very very important historical document which has documented which has narrated the story stories mean the real stories it's a book of history about different kings of kashmir and also mentions about amrit prabha who was a who was a daughter of kamrupa that is the earlier name of or prajyotishpura earlier name of assam who got married to the king of kashmir meghavahan his name was meghavahan and that is why i say the historical character and i am i am just, not just for the hack of it i am trying to remember a queen i am remembering her because after getting married to a king in kashmir which is around 2500 kilometers maybe 1600 miles in us standards you are more used to tell things in miles i believe 1600 miles away but she left her mark in a highly patriarchal society 2000 years back in kashmir how she did because she had got tremendous amount of love and affection for the common masses she was an empress she was a queen she was a daughter of a king in kamrupa and went to kashmir for marriage due to marriage but she built she did some social work she built some monuments she built some rest houses for the buddhist monks because some of you may already be knowing that buddhism arose or buddhism emerged in india 600 years before uh, amrit prabha got married to kashmir that means if buddhism arose at 6th century bc our amrit prabha from assam got married to king of kashmir in 1st century ad that means a gap of 600 to 700 years so that is my i want to say the first historical character of assam was a woman and i personally i personally despite being a male i take huge pleasure in the fact that it may be an incident of history tomorrow we may come to know about of some assamese in say second century bc and he may be a man that's a different issue we'll accept it but today as things stand today the first historical character of assam which is being represented in north carolina state university by dr nilakshi fukan was also a women called amrit prabha in the kingdom of kashmir i think that's very important secondly i will not be going into much detail because that was not my idea only some of the important slices of history which other people may love to relate to since they are also exposed to study it in world literature with emphasis on 20th century hindi urdu fiction as has been taught by dr fukan so 
if we come back to say around 6th, 7th century AD, we come to know about a king called Bhaskar Burman in Assam, about whom the Chinese traveler Huan Sang wrote, and I don't want to, uh, I want, I don't want to tell you what a traveler wrote about a king. Traveler, if he is treated well, that's a gen gen normal human tendency. They will be writing well only. And you know, medieval times, ancient times, it was only a king centric, an emperor centric narrative being developed by many of the court historians and many of the travelers. I don't blame them. I don't blame them in retrospect. Today, sitting before in uh, sitting in 21st century, I cannot blame them. I have to judge them in the context of the time in which they lived, in which they wrote. Now, my I, my only point here, limited point is, I don't. I am not interested, or my I think my students also may not be that interested to know about what Yuan Sang wrote about the king. But he wrote about the Assamese people and Assamese language. These two things are important. 7th century AD, that means 1300, 1400 years ago, Yuan Sang said the language spoken in Assam was different from what he saw in other parts of India. That means that was the time of the Assamese language. That was the time in which Assamese language started developing a distinctive character of its own. I think this is important. This is not king centric. This is a development. This is an intellectual development. This is a linguistic development, which has been recorded by the eyes of a traveler who came from China, whose name was Yuan Sang. Point number one. Point number two, my dear students, what I am trying to highlight and underline. Point number two is he also wrote about the hospitality of Assamese people. So. Uh, I don't know. I cannot give you a proof of that hospitality of Assamese people. If at all somebody can give you a proof, it is the smiling lady, Dr. Nilakshi Fukan. She will be able to give if you go to her place. But at the same time, I don't say that I don't provoke you to go to her place tomorrow itself. But give her some time. I'm sure she will give you a slice of Assamese hospitality. And thank you. Uh, sorry for being a little bit of informal at times because otherwise it tends to get boring. So I beg my apology, Dr. Fukan. Uh, I'm not trying to pull your leg, but I'm just trying to say in a present day classroom, someone sitting in North Carolina and someone talking on Zoom from a Sam. So in that context only, you are you are bound to come in and you have come in. And if you feel you are Chandwis, you are Chandwis between love and respect of your students, nothing else. Anyway, coming back to the coming back. Uh, the, fifth, the 15th century Assam or 15th century India, I think some of your students might have already read, the Bhakti movement grew. Why? What is Bhakti movement? You, you suppose in Christianity also you will find Catholics and Protestant. In Protestant you will find Baptist and many other denominations. The old religion generally tends to be conservative and the newly branched out one, generally speaking, there can be some exception. They are more progressive. They are more radical. So what has happened? The Hindu religion and some of the other religions in India, they became a lot of ritualistic, cumbersome, and they became expensive for the common people because there is a class between the God and the commoners. And to simplify that, to simplify that, Bhakti saints emerged in different parts of India. And Assam did not lag behind. In fact, Assam can take deliberate and rational pride in the fact that the photograph of the saint, which Dr. Fukon has shown now, Mahapuruk Srimanta Hongkordev, he was a versatile genius. And his versatile genius has been endorsed by, has been endorsed by scholars from other parts of the world also. I am not saying just because I am not harping on SMS hospitality. I am not harping on the beauty of us or the taste of Assam tea, or I am not harping on the intellectually very advanced or a mere or the genius of Hong Kong Dave just because of the fact that I am also an SMS. No, this is a classroom. We have to be guided by some of the intellectual accepted yardsticks based on logic and arguments, we have to talk. So even basing my things on those arguments, I am saying this because this man, I always treat him, many people in Assam treat him as God or semi-God. I treat him as a man. 
as a flesh and blood man and i really get i really get astounded that what kind of genius he was he was a social reformer he was a religious preacher he was an artist he was a sculptor he was a musician he could sing he could dance he could annex some place and most importantly most importantly genius is one part of it but most important i personally and i'm sure your students and you will also agree with me on this point that his thought process and principles the religious order which he established simplifying the hindu religion there was no middleman between god and the devotees and it is always good that's why religion became simple religion became a direct kind of interconnection between the god and the devotees and in the process the middleman who takes lot of interest for some other reasons earlier times or even now in all the religions not only in hinduism degree will vary from religion to religion i think that middle class or that middleman those uh, priestly class they tend to feel little bit of offended because their business or their importance in society dwindled it came down but we are not concerned about that we are concerned about how honkardev assured in a world of equality a world of what do you call uh, a tremendous amount of fellow feel feeling love and affection and great emphasis on freedom of thoughts and also equality of all human beings see basically what united states of america majority of you i will not say all what you are celebrating what you are known for in the world why you are considered as a thought leader of the world many of the things were also done by srimant of concordep in the state of assam 500 550 years ago and that is why i think he is unique in comparison to other saints which emerged which took uh, were born in different other parts of india the i'll tell you two three things about him about women 550 years back how he treated women his wife sankardev propagated a religion in which there was no place for idol i hope must my dear students it is very clear he said there is no place for idol in my religion it's a direct contact direct devotion unalloyed unceasing unflinching devotion of the devotee on one hand and god or the supreme deity the vishnu on the other hand now he comes and tells that there will be no intermediary there will be no icon there will be no idol in this religion now what happens his wife kalindi i himself worships or worshiped an icon at her home it has been endorsed written by lakmina desburwa the doyen of assamese writer who took part in in formulating the modern assamese language and literature and who extensively wrote about the 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 man lakshminath besburu on the left hand side top left hand side you will see a 20 rupee stamp of india in which dr fukon has collected the photograph of lakshminath besburu besburu writes about shankardev and shankardev's wife worshiping an icon or an idol at her own place but shankardev never told or never pressurized his wife to son or to relinquish idol worshiping so such was his respect for freedom of women freedom of women thought process ultimately it was done by his own disciple madhavdev who prevailed upon honkardev's wife that you please discontinue worshiping this icon because your husband the great guru honkardev himself was propagating a religion in which there is no place for any idol so we can we can just this we can just this his attitude towards women how he treated his wife at his own place not today not in 21st century not in 20th century i am talking about 15th century india 15th century assam where patriarchy was very very strong and intense in our society so it was an amazing feat secondly i am going here little fast because uh, uh i i'm i'm going here little fast because i have to i have just want to cover but later on you can ask some other questions also see we 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 talk about we talk about environmental awareness climate change all other things and i i give credit to your vice president not the present one 
who happens to be half Indian, that's a different issue. Your vice president during Bill Clinton's time, Mr. Al Gore. Al Gore may be known as an environmental extremist. People may tell him an extremist. Amazing. Before Al Gore, I think nobody thought about the planet and climate change and ecological issues as profoundly and deeply as he did. Here, I want to respectfully remind my students and some of the other people who have joined this class that Srimanta Concorde 500 years back, he said only one line, that one tree is equal to 10 sons, 10 boys. That means doho putro homo brikho. Can you imagine in a patriarchal society, in an underdeveloped country at that point of time, I am talking about my own country, India, my own state, Assam, the man comes and tells, one tree is equal to 10 boys or 10 sons. Where everyone is, everyone wants to have a son. One tree is equal to 10 sons. So that was the environmental awareness or visionary, environmental visionary, Srimanta Hongkordev, he was, which has been written by all other scholars whose names we have seen, Moheshwar Neo, Banikanto Kakuti in different ways, along with Kalaguru Vishnu Prakhad Rava, four scholars or literatures whose photographs Dr. Fukon has shown. The third very important uh, point, uh, if you can just uh, for the last time go back to Srimanta Hongkordev's slide, uh, uh, if you can go there, yeah, thank you. Uh, see, the third most important thing, I am tempted to compare him with one of your presidents, past president, the third president of United States of America. We all respect him. His name is Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was born 200 years nearly after Concordia. And we know Thomas Jefferson is not only important in US history because he was the third president. Because he's more important, he was the principal drafter of American Declaration of Independence. This is very important. And he talks about a lot of lofty things with other world countries at later point of time. Many of the things we tried to emit it, we tried to imbibe. Great. He is a great leader, but there is in one particular issue, let me respectfully tell you that on one particular issue, what he said, he did not practice in his own life. We know Thomas Jefferson had got huge estates in Virginia and all, and he had got a lot of slaves. He was, he, was, he was criticizing slavery in many of his writings, but in his own personal estate, he has got a lot of slaves, which... George Washington manumitted his slaves on his death. But Thomas Jefferson, even after his death, he did not manumit his slaves. He distributed among his children. I am just telling this aspect where he did not go by what he preached. So now I want to say, Srimanta Hongkorde, being a religious preacher, he was no king, he was no president. As a social reformer, at that point of time, we have got numerous instances that he manumuted many slaves in Assam. Of course, one caveat that slavery in the United States of America in 18th century was quite different from the kind of slavery we had in 15th century Assam. Slavery in USA is much more intense. It was much more, what I say, uh, it was much more terrifying, rather horrifying. In Assam, it was simply milder, but even then, he manumitted them. So this is this is three areas, non-religious areas. Generally, I don't want to talk about religion because religion generally have a tendency to divide. Whereas other human ethos, your pain and my pain is same. Your suffering and my suffering is same. Your joy and my joy is same. So our human emotions, sense religion can unite us. You may be sitting there in North Carolina State University. I may be sitting in a place called Gohati in Assam, but we can be united by our human feelings. But if we bring in religious issues, there may be, I'm not saying all the time, people may be divided because people generally have very strong opinions about their own religion. Even atheists and agnostics, they also have their strong opinion about their atheism or about their agnosticism. Anyway, leaving aside that, I will, since I was talking about environment, I will also try to talk about uh, Nilakshi. 
Naranarayan who was there during Hong Kong Dev's time and even afterwards. Here I am. I just try to. I would like to give an example of a British traveler, Ralph Fitz. Ralph Fitz came to India 400 years ago, and Naranarayan was a king on the western part of Assam and present-day Bengal. So I am. I was astounded when I first read it because Naranarayan's kingdom had hospital for the animals. That means veterinary hospitals 400 years ago, as recorded by a British traveler called Ralph Feeds, which many of our local historians did not record. A British historian, that's why I really appreciate the good points of other uh, countries also. And we have to learn the good points from all the places. And that's why I'd like to say Ralph Feeds' statement that Naranarayan in Assam had a veterinary hospital 400 years ago also tells about the glory of Assam and Assamese, which is the main topic today. And friends, again, I would like to reiterate what I am telling is absolutely based on history. It is not because of the fact that I belong to this place and I have got some fancy ideas about the place and I have got a very good audience today, intellectually vibrant audience. That's why I will say anything about my state. No, never. Everything in an academic surrounding academic ambience, everything has to be based on, as I, as I told, now I'd like to reiterate on solid arguments and rational thoughts. Otherwise, it will not be accepted by the world. Anyway, now I'd like to come to American Baptist missionaries. You know, friends, all of most of you are Americans. Some of you may not be born in America, but America is your country. Now you celebrate America in a very different way, in a diverse way. I respect that. Why I'm saying? Because I don't know that it may be a diverse group. And some of you definitely be, you'll be, uh, you were born American and you are, you are America. You carry America in your cultural, in your intellectual DNA. I respect that. I am now trying to uh, tell you that missionaries from America in 19th century Assam, they saved our language to a great extent. Of course, I will not say they are the sole warriors but they are an important group of warriors. I have to tell you a little bit of history. See, Assam is small. The uh, number of Assamese speak, you can go to Google and find out. And our neighboring uh, state of Bengal is quite big. And the, the Bengali speaker's number is also quite huge in the world. So what has happened? I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just telling you a, a statement of fact. In 1836, when British came and occupied Assam late, like the mainland India was occupied first and subsequently due to some historical factors, they came and occupied Assam in 19, uh, sorry, 1828, lower Assam, the western part of Assam and uh, 38, the upper Assam also, the eastern part of Assam. In between, they thought that there's lot some similarity between Bengali and Assamese. I'm sure Dr. Fukon, you might have told about different languages and Assamese, Bengali, some of your students would be aware. So British, due to their convenience, the British ruler, the imperialist British rulers, they replaced Assamese with Bengali, thinking that both are similar and it will be easier for the imperialist British to work in Bengal, in Bengali and also work in Assam in Bengali with one language. But ultimately, what happened? Our people initially, they had a lot of issues just before British came. They welcomed British because they thought peace and security is important. There was a lot of internal strife. There are a lot of uh, incursion, attack from the Myanmar side, the Manor Akraman, we call it. And Assamese people, they have been reduced. One third, two third of the people perished. Can you imagine? Two third of a small community perished in the early part of 19th century. And that is why they wel welcome British. And when British replace their mother tongue with Bengali, there are some murmur of protest initially after a long, long time, not initially, because they thought British would ultimately bring back Assamese. When it was not done, at that point of time comes your American Baptist missionaries. See, American Baptist missionaries came to propagate a new form of Christianity in northeastern part of region where Assam is situated. And there they found when they landed, see, I, I, my, I, my hats off to British, I will give you some example. The first and second Assamese grammar were not written by an Assamese, were not written by an Indian, they were written by an American. Williamson and 
sorry, Robinson and Dr. Nathan Brown. Robinson wrote the first grammar of Assamese and Dr. Nathan Brown, which is a much more comprehensive one, Grammatical Notices of Assamese Language. This is the name. It was, it was published sometime in 1840s, 1850s. Why they wrote? They came to propagate religion. Why they started? They published the first newspaper of Assam. The name is Orunudoy. And that nomenclature of Orunudoy, which means the sun is rising. It's a beautiful name in Assamese. Beautiful Nilakshi can understand and appreciate. The name Orunudoy provides a kind of positive, positive joy and sort of exuberance, sort of positive thought process he throws to any person's mind who knows Assamese. But can you imagine students, this name of Orunudoy was given by an American lady who happened to be the wife of Dr. Nathan Brown, who wrote the second Assamese grammar. And her name was Eliza Brown. They came, when they came to Assam, they thought that everything is conducted in Bengali, but common people do not understand. Because British has imposed Bengali, replaced Assamese with Bengali in 1836. These people also come at the same time. And that time, they had to tell British, they told British, no, Bengali is not the language, you replace it. Of course, there are some Assamese people, Assamese intellectuals, the newly emerging Assamese intellectual called Anandaram Dhekyal Fukon, Gunabhiram Borua and Hamsundra Borua, but their coordination and association and assistance came from this American Baptist missionary. And another missionary called Miles Bronson, whose tombstone or grave you will find in the state of Michigan in the United States of America now, He's still there. I, today also I checked up in Google. You can find Dr. Miles Bronson tomb or Miles Bronson grave, I think in the state of Michigan. He wrote the second Assamese dictionary, not the first one, the second Assamese dictionary containing around 14,000 words in at, at a time when everyone thought that uh, Bengali was the language spoken here. So I mean to say when they found difficult that if we talk to people in Bengali and try to make them change their religion from Hinduism to Christianity, we fail. And that is why they started publishing Assamese journal newspaper, Orunudoy. They started writing Assamese grammar book. They started publishing Assamese dictionaries and they laid the foundation of I'll not say they are the only people. There are other Assamese emerging intellectual whose name I already took, but they were also American Baptist missionary, Nathan Brown, Miles Bronson, Oliver Cutter. I think the name of this Troika or Triumvirate are very, very important in the mod history of modern Assamese literature language, or if you say the history of the modern Assam. Because without their support, probably it would have been very difficult for the Assamese intellectuals to establish before the British that Assamese is a different religion with no perceptible link with Bengali language. And ultimately, in the year 1872 and 1873, both the years, I think this uh, Bengali was replaced with Assamese after 37 years. So in our own state, we did not have our state language for 37 years. Ultimately, in 1873, British replaced it. But who prevailed upon the British? The emerging Assamese intellectuals and American Baptist missionaries. That's why I bow my head in reverence to American Baptist missionaries like Dr. Brown and Miles Bronson. My, and they knew after some time, after 10 years, 15 years, they knew that it is very difficult to convert the Hindu people who are a follower of Srimanta Konkordev into different religion. But even then, they persisted with their literary and linguistic journey. I think I will say that role of American Baptist missionary in creating a foundation of modern Assamese literature and language is still today insufficiently appreciated. It should be appreciated more because we have to realize the purpose for which they came. We have to realize the context. They lost their wife, someone lost their wife, someone lost their children. They are 8,000 miles away. And America and Assam during that point of time, maybe around two months journey, maybe one and a half month journey on ship. You know, don't know once you go, whether you will reach your homeland or no. 
at that point of time they learned a new language wrote their grammar wrote their dictionary it's truly amazing it's truly truly amazing though hats off to them uh there are there are many uh, facts but uh, uh, i don't know uh, nilakshi how much time i can take so that uh, accordingly because generally since i have a habit of talking in extempore i i don't know how much time i have taken yeah if you can indicate i will also have my sip of water uh, as you have been doing <laughs> uh, yeah you can um, take 10 more minutes probably and then okay. we will open for questions okay 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 fine fine that is the importance of third empire in uh, you know in america cricket is not very popular maybe not today's america it may be different so you are like a third empire although you are a very gracious host and very kind enough to have invited me anyway thank you for that 10 minutes that you have indicated this will this will help me to structure the last part of my lecture and then we'll go to the question answer session see uh, then 19, i leave aside 19th century in 20th century also we had lot of struggles and all we don't about we don't want to talk about all those struggles and all now uh, she has very appropriately and aptly brought a uh, picture before you uh, thanks to nilakshi where we can see juti prakhar agarwala on the right hand side top then two ladies we see uh, left hand side nolini bala devi dr mamuni roysham guswami who happened to be my teacher in delhi university in uh, late uh, in 90s of last century so i can also take say although despite not being an old man that i studied in last century in delhi and now i am in a different century and in a different place and most important is dr bhupen hazarika dr bhupen hazarika who symbolized in modern day assam outside world and many of the people i think he is the most well known assamese Uh, has been awarded all uh, awards are not very important but i'm just saying he has been awarded with bharat ratna the highest civilian award given by government of india but the most important award is with his songs with his kind of lyrics and the kind of thoughts he was thinking about the humanity at large he was thinking about the exploited he was thinking about the people the persecuted people the marginalized people the peripheral people and that is why bhupen hazarika lyrics are very very unique and he was the main force he was the main modest uh, what i'll say robust template who identified the sense of being a modern assamist to the outside world and this bhupen hazarika had a very very interesting history in usa in 1949 two years after indian independence bhupen hazarika goes to the uh, one of the best university of usa the columbia university and he goes to columbia university he thought he uh, did post graduation in political science from banaras indian university then worked for some time in all india radio in guwahati then he goes to usa for phd in mass communication see today whatever tool that technologically we have been assisted by klein and uh, dr fukon has been kind enough but see this is also a tool of mass communication covid has accentuated this covid has amplified its importance and efficacy and effectiveness and utility today see last two uh, last two years we have been talking so much but we have been talking mostly through these tools so this can also be a tool which was thought by dr bhupen hazarika in columbia university around 70 80 years back when he did his phd an important part is when he landed up in usa he was imprisoned for 7 days i am tempted to tell recount this story to the students you will wonder what happened he, he came for phd in colombia and he was straight away he went to jail from the he went on ship i think not by air and from the directly from the port he was taken to the why because he wrote something he could not say because bisnu rabha another doyen and his uh, used to respect him a lot bisnu rabha i think sometime back he showed the photograph he wrote a book bisnu rabha wrote the main monograph in which Bhupen Hazarika also wrote something, and that the name of the book in English was Temple of Freedom. In Okhomia, it is called in Assamese, it is called Mukti Deul. So they were not wondering because American intelligence and other things are so strong. And you know, at that point of 1949, America, although McCarthyism might not have come, but America always had a very, very what I will say, uncomfortable relation with the communists and all. And Bhupen Hazarika and Bisnu Rabha, they had got some leftist leanings. so strong american intelligence came to know that a student is coming from india 
and he has written a book eulogizing or praising the leftist ideology and straight away he went there for seven days in jail but the same bhupen azarika ultimately that misunderstanding all were very very short lived it was ephemeral everything went out dissipated bhupen azarika completed his phd met his future wife who was from gujarat and they were settled in uganda see the world is a small world in 1949 itself i think in 1950 he married 1952 their only son who stays in usa now new york days hazarika was born and bupan hazarika completed his phd and comes back and become bupan hazarika as we know him today another interesting thing in usa itself this is the beauty that that's why i was highlighting on the diversity of united states of america sometimes when we live in a country we do not appreciate its utility or its importance usa was great in the sense same usa where he landed up in jail same usa he got an award from president's wife and that time president was very famous franklin roosevelt roosevelt's wife was eleanor roosevelt eleanor roosevelt bupen azarika represented the indian students studying in usa at that point of time and got an award from eleanor roosevelt bupen azarika became very friendly and he used to respect him a lot paul robson old man river you don't say nothing you just keep rolling along and he wrote he comes back and writes bistir no parore ohoin khojonore ha ha kar khuniu this is a beautiful number so see how he got inspiration from paul robson and bhupen azarika you know but nilakshi would be knowing dr fukon would be knowing in all his function all throughout the world and till the time he had function uh, when he was physically capable he passed away in the year 2011 before that he always used to conclude his function with a number from with a song from whom paul robson we are on the same boat brother we are on the same boat brother if you tip one and gonna rock the other we are we in the same boat brother my lyrics and all tends to get a uh, lot of because i'm not a singer only thing i'm tempted nobody is there only the computer screen is there that's why i somehow gathered some courage to sing and hum uh, just to give a fact that bhupen hazarika always always concluded all his functions with this number from paul robson who was a black rights activist plus a songwriter was a very very powerful musician of united states of america there is a story story means is a true story bupen azarika once asked because paul robson was senior he was holding a guitar and he he asked him what is this bupen azarika goes and asks paul robson what you are holding what is this then he says this is a guitar then bupen azarika perhaps said oh this is a musical instrument then paul robson corrects him saying that despite being or in addition to being a musical instrument this is an instrument of change that means through my guitar i can change the society and that's what he tried to do and that's why bupen hazarika after coming back to india and assam he tried to do all throughout his life so bupen hazarika's life in a way the way he lived it is a tribute to paul robson that way someone in india and someone in united states of america see how they are on principle on thought process they were they were moving in tandem they were not that's but there may be lot of differences but ultimate aim of humanity of caring for humanity the sense of empathy what i was telling at the time of explaining the wonderful initiative of simonta hongkorde all those things you will find in bupen hazarika's thing the 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 reasons for which usa was known i was again i told some time back that liberalism the free thought freedom of speech democratic tenets liberal principles all those things used to pulsate all those things used to throb rupantore he jagat duniya kore e mor gayatri mantra that means this is the sacrosanct mantra of my life change as we say change is the only constant of life that's a very famous axiom or maxim or dictum similarly in a very very musical sense our jyoti prakash agarwal says that 
it is it is what you call uh, rupantor the change change is the only constant in a very different way the importance of change because change is inevitable change you have to embrace this zoom and google the fact that i am talking to you through 8000 miles away on google or on zoom this is also change we cannot be allergic to this change we have to accept it so otherwise this wonderful opportunity being given by north carolina state university i would not been have been i would not have been able to reap its full benefit but i don't know what kind of benefits i could give to my dear students i i while concluding because time seems to be over so at the time of conclusion i would like to say only one or two things to my dear students it is not intended for other senior people who might have joined this uh, class i sometimes have developed butterflies while called that this is a class because i generally <laughs> to talk in a very free willing way uh, without being without being what you call influenced very highly by the intellectual underpinnings or academic overtones of an university or a classroom but even then i would take this liberty and request humbly to all my students that what i try to tell about my place my land my people it was based on facts i don't expect all of you to go into depth of all the issues what i tried to highlight but if some of you at any point of time if you feel like see i am a man who will be giving highest importance to your free will because i was telling that we have to cherish that free thought your freedom of thought and freedom of speech if at any point of time if you feel that i want to do something i want to do something which may be directly or remotely associated with the state of assam or the assamese people i am telling you giving you a commitment solemn commitment before dr nilakshi fukan dr klein and other other people that i will be very happy to help you out in whatever way may be possible for me sitting in assam if you want to do something at the same time i wish first of all like any human being on this planet i will wish let this pandemic go let let us we should be able to unmask ourselves after knowing that there is no virus in the air that should go that will be a collective prayer for everyone but leaving aside or coming aside from that collective prayer my students here if i can tell those 20 25 i request all of them so that whatever potential they had and whatever uh, aspiration they had in their eyes i hope they will be able to translate those aspiration into reality and they will be they will be assets to the society i will not say the society of the united states of america they will be assets to the human society because that is what human potential is capable of and that is what a premier institution like north carolina state university is eminently capable of of transforming their potentialities into being the ambassadors of humanity i hope they will be able to do it and people like dr nilakshi fukan will guide them with all their earnestness and sincerity thank you dr fukan once again uh, i pause here if there is any question and all if i feel i'll be able to handle it definitely i'll try to answer their question thank you Thank you very much, Mayur Bora. Uh, so yes, we do have some questions. First, I would like to invite Aman. Aman, can you hear me? Yes, Please I can. Go ahead you. and ask your question. Yeah. Um, okay, so I had a question earlier when you were uh, you mentioned the Bhakti movement. So I I did some research while you were uh, while you were talking about it, and I wanted to ask, did the movement since it you know it um the bhakti movement had this this uh, they had like a different philosophy that transversed like religious and cultural groups and was adopted by different different demographics throughout the, throughout india um did that like was it adopted by religious groups or were individuals from groups like did they deviate towards like that common practice okay i think that's a very very insightful question uh, i thank you for that uh, whatever little i have understood from the question you asked it's a very important question in a sense see uh, bhakti saints emerged mainly in medieval india in different places of india 
See, when we talk about different places of India, there may be 15 of them or 20 of them. I talk mostly about Srimanta Hongkordip in Assam. Basic, if you see by and large, their philosophy and religious standards are same. They say there should not be any intermediary. All of them stood for simplicity of religion. All of them wanted the cumbersome, expensive procedure of religion to go. But here your important question comes in. In case of principal deity, the principal god, they are different. Hongkor Dev said Vishnu, Nanak, ultimately he preached Sikhism, ultimately which branched out as a separate religion. The Sikh, the people with turbans and all, you have seen, you might have seen in different parts of USA, huge in numbers. And that's a, that's a separate religion itself. He also started as a Bhakti movement only. But since there are a lot of differences, it branched out as a different kind of religion. Okay. Secondly, Ramananda. Some of the other saints, their principal god was different, Rama. So if you take a very, very, what you call objective view sitting in 21st century now, uh, I will feel these names are important at that point of time. Names will be important for you and me also when we worship them. But when you try to analyze them in a classroom, in an intellectual way, analytical way, then I think more than the names, whether he's Vishnu or Rama, the modus operandi of reaching that Vishnu or Ram, the principal God, is very, very important. And there, almost all the Bhakti saints, which were born in different parts of India, in a span of three, four hundred years, it initially started in South India, in Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and all. Later on, it came to Maharashtra, North India and Assam, where I talked about extensively. So all those things came, but by and large, they stood for simplicity and they wanted that cumbersome religious procedure, which ultimately harms the common people who are already been devastated by different other factors, like his crop might have failed, because medieval India is a different ball game. It was a different kind of uh, culture, different kind of economy. So they have got many issues. And despite having those issues, if they have to, while worshipping God, if they have to go through an elaborate procedure, then it was very, very taxing on them. So on that particular point, standing for simplicity of religion, almost all Bhakti saints are equal. But on other issues, which you have rightly highlighted, there are some nuanced, subtle differences. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So next question is coming from Gyanam Mahajan Ji. She's at uh, University of California, Los Angeles. Gyanam Ji, please go ahead. Unmute yourself. Hey, Namaskar and uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, may I ask about the link between languages, dialects and uh, Assamese identity and cultures? See, for me, there is no one-to-one -one, uh, link or, uh, you know, it's difficult to define one Assamese uh, culture. It's always cultures, right? And uh, that's why I'm wondering about the role of dialects uh, spoken by the different indigenous peoples of uh, Assam, you know, <coughs> like a dominant group, one dominant version of Assamese language, and, you know, always like this, one identity, one national identity, I mean, things that basically people like me just don't believe in and are actually destroying the fabric of our uh, nation. So on a smaller level, just to do with Assam, someone like, we, someone like me would like to caution again, you know, what's being done to our country on the national level, being done at the uh, Assam uh, level and kind of pitting people, you know, one against the other. I know you referred to India as a democracy and one could kind of argue about that. Uh, but anyways, um, yeah, I will leave you to answer this question. Things that have been happening these days. So I am talking about the current context where a set of people at the border with another state can be so uh, driven by, uh, you know, such, such an irrational um, Feeling. So I was just looking to, towards 
you know, because I know you are the person I can ask this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> can I answer that, madam? Uh, first of all, uh, Mahajanji, uh, I really commend and compliment you. And while you were asking the questions, because very frankly speaking, I was not knowing the type of audience and diversity of their thought process. I was smiling all throughout. My smile actually automatically endorses what you are saying. I'll, I'll, I'll give you only two terms. Monochromatic stiffness is the last thing any liberal person will want, whether in Assam or in USA or in California to which you or where you stay. See, there are forces in this world and you know the rise of the strongmans in different geographies of the world. And with this, how monochromatic stiffness in terms of our culture, in terms of our language, in terms of our thought process, how it has been very, very assiduously, notoriously, viciously and adroitly, how they have been imposed by the powers that be. I am absolutely on the same page. I understood the trust and essence of the question. I appreciate that. I appreciate because this is the reason that's the beauty of engaging in a debate. But here I have to I have to tell you in terms of Assam also Assam is a mini India. It may it may sounds like a cliche or a platitude or a hackneyed phrase. But even then, in a sense, see, I am an Assamese speaker. So in a way, if I take a very narrow sense, which many people do, many people even now also do numbers are coming down. Many people feel we are the we are the people. It's some kind of ethno nationalism based on a language, which is they say that accepted by Indian constitution. There's a lot of Sanskrit words, a lot of tribal, this thing. So this is the language. And through this language, we will try to dominate others. There is there is a section. There is absolutely no denying the fact. But fortunately or unfortunately, I do not belong to that. That is why I say I say that dialects you have very rightly pointed out. That means you know about the history of you may be knowing much more than me. You know, when you talk about dialects, see the Bodo people, the Missings, the Karbis, the Dimasas, they all have their dialects and they all have their if if somebody has a patent on their motherland, if all of us collectively known as Assamese, which some of the tribes they will they will object to that. Also, I know I am telling you frankly, if collectively for the purpose of this discussion, we assume that we are all Assamese. Even then, I will say, I will go stick my neck out and say that tribal people who are the original inhabitants, they have got their primary patents. If I can borrow that word from the scientific lexicon, I will say on the state of Assam. But there are many, madam, in this, in during Assam hesitation time, during many time, you will find that, you know, before French Revolution, someone said, no, France, middle class mind is an asset, but middle class mentality is a liability. So this kind of liability we also see, but only positive factor is despite the rise of strongmen in different geographies of the world, equally importantly, a thought process has come and started animating the collective consciousness of SMS people that if you have that kind of domination that you are SMS, you will talk only about SMS. No, that has to go. You have to be inclusive not in meetings, not in slogan airing. You have to be inclusive in practice because preaching something like I was, I myself was referring to Thomas Jefferson. I have got highest respect for him, but about slavery, I cannot have that sort of respect for him. So what you preach, you have to practice. I can only tell uh, Gyanam uh, Z that I try to practice to the best extent possible. I am, I am a human being with my failings, susceptibilities, about that particular issue of uh, that uh, recent fight or strife between a neighboring state and Assam, uh, we have to go back to the history because when you go to 19th century, when that Lusai Hill was first taken up by British, there is a demarcation of boundary. And later on, after 20, 25 years, there was again some reorganization of that boundary. Now, the main dispute lies about whether to accept boundary A, which was 25 years back, or boundary B. Now the problem, had it been only boundary A and B, it could have been solved. I, I can tell you, people like you and me could have solved, but there are people who do not want this problem to be solved, who do not, they want to complicate, they want to politicize. So that is there, I believe, in different degrees in all parts of the world. And we also see with much to our dissatisfaction, anger, anguish, 
that is also there but i have to commend you what a beautiful question you have asked that relates to all the geographies of the world in one sense and also to my state about the state i try to speak something with little bit of passion because that is that is i think that's a forte and that's my spontaneous style since i try to speak extempore and you you really beautified complimented in, in with a beautiful question i know you will not be although you are smiling you may not be satisfied with my answer but i can tell you i can tell you i can tell you had people like you and me we are only i am just giving you an example i am not saying gyanam mahajan and moyur bora i am saying had sensible people been there more in politics and more in public domain things would have been different and things would have been better that's my firm belief but we will will we will not rest we'll try to please up thank you madam what's a wonderful question you are from uh, california university right i'm at ucla and uh, UCLA, I'm, okay. yes i'm at ucla and you know uh, uh, the dismantling of academics and uh, academic institutions in india and the sheer shredding of uh, uh, you know uh principles etc is so alarming that uh you know what is happening in assam like even this recent uh, you know there are police it's it's back to a colonial system where the police is firing on its own people or firing across borders on its own people this happened during col colonial times so i was just yeah, yeah. To, Uh, uh hear you because i know that you often talk about uh you know yeah. issues to do with uh peoples and uh kind of on a principled basis yeah 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 and yeah thank you i just want to at last i would like to say to your question only one thing i i cannot claim to be a rational man i cannot claim even to be a liberal man but madam believe me honestly speaking I just try to be a liberal and rational man only because beyond that there's nothing else It's far huge monumental gigantic than what we know I am talking about all human beings together starting from the nobel laureate to the maybe the farmer in the field because the quantum of our uh, things we do not know is so huge ultimately we all can be equated but there if you try to be rational and liberal if not anything else you can make your surrounding society a better place thank you madam for a wonderful question yeah mayur uh, mayur uh, uh, we yeah. have a couple of questions okay niana yeah. can you uh, can you please go ahead riana okay i um i just want to know if the cultural differences um changed drastically compared to the rest of india in your opinion uh would you please repeat riana if i have yeah. pronounced your name correctly yeah what It's differences Diana. you see um i was just wondering if the cultural differences have changed drastically um in assam compared to the rest of india in your opinion okay you see this is a very broad question it's a very important question but it's very broad cultural differences you said right mm -hmm. cultural differences changing of cultural differences in different places of the world when you try to compare a state with the country to which that state belongs or if you compare that country to the whole world i think you will get different kind of answers my hunts my presumption uh, or i'll my thoughts on your question will be see certain differences will be there certain changes have to be there will be there and that has to be welcomed by the subsequent generations but there are certain changes which i think some of the things in the world should remain as sacrosanct as it was there 200 years back i'll tell you respect to elders see sometime back earlier you have might have heard about child marriage you might have heard about sati you might have heard about uh, that casteism in india or the people how other colored people fare in uh, us we want all those things to go there is no there cannot be two opinions on that but what i mean to say certain things when you talk about differences the new changes and differences in on certain sphere certain realms we have to accept it see now with covid we have accepted many other things i am very sure being a young lady at some point of time 2 years back you might have never worn this mask but now you have made it a part of your life that's good that's good for your health that's good for the health of the society in which you inhabit 
So similarly, this is a change we have to accept it. But there are many in your state, in your country, in my country, in different countries who do not accept that, who says that there is no pandemic. People are making a fuss out of it. See, see anything just, just for the heck of being contrarian, just for the heck of being that I am a different man, I have a different opinion. That doesn't mean that you will have any sort of opinion which cannot be supported by any stretch of imagination or rational thought. So your question, without doing a substantive, profound academic research, it is very difficult if you ask me that cultural differences that you see in Assam vis-a-vis -vis Tamil Nadu or vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Indianapolis or Minnesota or California, it would be very difficult to say. So that's why I'm saying some differences. See, nobody can escape. It is an inescapable reality of life. The differences will be there, but certain differences we have to welcome and certain differences we have, we must repudiate. We should not welcome it just because of the fact it's a new fact looming over the mental horizon of the people at this point of time. Right. Uh -huh. Thank you. Since, uh, since Thank you so much. have classes, they are, um, they already left, you know, most of the students okay. already left. So Landon, okay. would you like to ask your question? Landon, Fatima, Mayuk, uh, you have still have your questions, right? Okay, go ahead, Landon. Uh, sure. I was just, uh, I remember towards the beginning of the, your lecture that you were talking about Assam being famous for tea. I was just wondering, is that because of the British Empire? Or was it uh, before then that Assam was famous for its tea production? Okay. okay, that's a very important historical question. <clears throat> See, history doesn't, uh, we cannot explain the fact of history with the help of ifs and buts. That's my thought about history. But even then, even then, I would like to say, had British been not there, British came for their colonial and imperialistic uh, designs and reasons. We all know that. But in the process of that exploitation, colonial exploitation and all, they brought in a little bit of modern education, they brought in railways, they brought in a little bit of industrialization. Also, although at the same time, India was also de-industrialized, drain of wealth took place. There are many theories, I don't want to go into detail. Coming back to your pointed question of had British been not there, whether the tea industry would have been, I personally feel tea industry otherwise also would have come, but, but, it would not have flowered or in the initial period, it would have probably run into a lot of rough weather in the beginning because of British effort. See, in the first 50 years or 60 years, they exploited. See, they are the colonial masters. They exploited, fight. But at the same time, the tea and other things, British had got, see what people used to say, that sun never sets in British empire. That was the kind of uh, image or uh, British had all throughout the world. And that point of time when British comes and tells, and I go and tell 150 years back, I think both will not carry similar kind of weight. I would have, I would have desired that my, this thing also would be accepted with a similar kind of enthusiasm and gusto, but no, I can, I have to be rational. So what British did was in that sense was something extraordinary for different reasons, which helped in developing the tea industry to the present level but at the same time i would also tell you the exploitation of the laborers which are not mostly from mainland india i mean to say they are not from assam because see this is a plantation based industry tea industry is a plantation you need huge amount of workers assamis people for again you like it i like it dislike it they are not that industrious and diligent let me be very honest and let me make a general statement. Exceptions will be there. That's why they brought in people from Orissa, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, the present day, uh, those places. But the exploitation of those people was also but horrifying. So on one hand, right, I absolutely agree with you that tea industry flourished because of British push and because of the ownership was mostly with the British. Hi. Horrifying human tragedies also took place. So that was also a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fatima, I'm really sorry. You know, go ahead, please. Uh, no, you're fine. Uh, first yeah. of all, thank you so much for the uh, lovely lecture. I just had one quick question. Um, I was researching the state of Assam 
And okay. um, I, I believe, it, I think it said in 2016 that the state of Assam uh, was trying to increase tourism. And so they signed a contract actually with uh, Priyanka Chopra. And so I saw a couple of their commercials of advertising, yeah. like you said, their lovely tea, their hospitality, and how it's such a lovely place to be. Um, you know, since you live there, do, do you see an increase of tourism or has it stayed the same? Oh, oh that's a very, uh, very interesting question. Uh, Fatima, I'll say it's interesting as well as a lovely question from you. Uh, see, the, you are asking me the coming in of Priyanka Chopra, who is mostly based in Hollywood, not in Bollywood these days. Was there any have or did it have any material effect in the number of tourists? I see, frankly speaking, I do not have the data, but I can tell you about the two narratives coming there and where I believe that also I can tell you. See, when Priyanka Chopra was roped in by giving a huge amount of money, which is quite uh, acceptable and obvious in today's world. When you want to hire a celebrity, you have to pay. Without payment, now nobody will come. So there is a section in Assamese people who say, then what is the requirement? No, no, our on our own, the tourism potential of the state would have gone. But I doubt that. I doubt that. See, in today's world, which has been driven by social media, which has been driven by, we know about, see, pastry people. We know about the celebrity. Sometimes we know more about the Hollywood celebrity, maybe Tom Hanks or Tom Cruise, then we know about our neighbors. It's a fact. You may be an exception, I may be an exception, but for most of the people, it's a fact. So that is why I think bringing Priyanka Chopra by Assam government was nothing, something not outlandish. I will not, uh, I'll not say that it was wrong, but at the same time, definitely I have got a belief since she has been brought, brought in, it might, even if it might not have uh, led to substantial increase, some increase in uh, tourists might have taken place. But sometimes we tell, no, that famous dictum, man proposes, God disposes. Nature brought in this tiny virus whom we cannot arrest, whom we cannot hire, whom we cannot intimidate, that the coronavirus. So everything has gone to a dog for most of the countries of the world. So we are back to square one. I hope in the coming times, uh, not only Priyanka Chopra, if I can take Priyanka Chopra as a template, I want all the people, especially people like you, not because of the fact that you might have belonged to, I don't know, you may belong to Pakistan or India or whatever. You belong to a place that is not important. The important thing is you are interested in history of Assam. People like you also can be an ambassador for Assamese, tourism and other good points of Assam, if you feel in your eyes, if there is any good point. I leave it to you. I will not say, I will not force my opinion on you. If you feel these are good things in Assam, this is a good thing in Afghanistan, this is a good thing in Poland, I will try to highlight that. Please do that. If you do that, I think you will also be our Priyanka Chopra, if I can use that analogy. Thank you. So um, we have Mayuk and Dipali. Mayuk, would you like to go now? Sure. Hi, Mr. Bora. We have exchanged our vowels for similar names. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my question to uh, thank you for the speech. And you know, my question to you would be uh, it's twofold. One is what is the future of Assamese literature at, in the sense that where do you see it going? Second, what is your opinion on how the mainland looks at Assam because I like that he brought in Bhagadatta into the picture because we know that um, in Mahabharata Naraka Sura is relegated to Prag Jyotisha which is Assam and Kamrup is basically where Gohati is currently and if we translate Prag Jyotisha it also means the city of Jyotish and we know that astrology in um, modern times is magic, myth, and anything that's to do with fallaciousness. And at the end of the day, Narakasura My analysis from this story is that we have relegated an anxiety with the East on it being unreliable in terms of its political footing, which is why we we are which is why Modi has to wear the you know gamasa all the time to tell us that he's a part of us, and also that uh, we are being given policy that's um, that's um, includes military therefore an enforcement of 
um, being a part of the mainland. So I wanted to ask, what are your opinions on this and where, yeah, that's my say. Yeah, the, your first question is clear. Second question, again, maybe I'll have a word with you. The first question, the future of Assamese literature. See, in Assam, at right now, if you ask this question, you will find, in any place, you will find two narratives. But Assam, why I'm harping on two narratives? Because there is a sizable section of the people in last 20 years, they have been telling that the modern Assamese parents Modern in the sense that those who were born maybe in last 30, 40 years and their children, they always go to English medium school. But I worked in different parts of India. It is not a phenomena which we see only in Assam. You go to Bengal, you go to uh, Punjab, you go to Maharashtra. These are the places where I work. It's a all India, pan India phenomenon. And maybe in other some parts of Europe also people say it is seen. So at the same time, so my question would be answer would be very, very pointed. Generally speaking, 50 years back, 60 years back, when majority of the people used to go to vernacular medium school, I think general awareness of Assamese literature among a larger section of people was quite wide. But I am not saying it may not be very profound and deep for all section of the people. But whereas now that trust or focus in terms of the uh, modern Assamese youths or the school children or the college going students in terms of their affinity or inclination or propensity towards their own literature and language has to some extent come down. And that is why people who are lamenting and ruining the future of the SMEs or any small uh, community's language and literature is not very rosy. It is rather very bleak. But I want to respectfully remind the people who are trying to popularize that narrative in today's Assam, just two, three days back, just to give my example, there's a young lady of Dibrugar University who was doing PhD in mathematics. I have never seen her. She suddenly brought all my 16 books, especially those my 14 books into Wikipedia. And she said she has read the book and she created profile of those books in Wikipedia. I'm just giving you my example. I am a non-entity. I'm telling you, let me be very honest. But there are many SMEs youths whom I don't know. They are working in different parts of the world or some of them are studying. Mostly they are in science or engineering background and they have converted Srimanta Hongkor Dev's Kirtan, Madhav Dev's Namgoka into Unicode. So I tend to go with the second narrative, although in terms of number, it might have come down the quality of the new generation and the kind of time and pointed focus they are giving to popularize their own language and literature. So I will say that future of Assamese language may not be very, very rosy in terms of having a large number of people being very excited about the fact. But at the same time, it is not very bleak either. And while saying so, I'm not trying to be diplomatic at all. I ultimately have a strong belief that ultimately that depends on the thought process of the youngsters. What I do, my friends do, are of limited importance. What my son, daughter, their generation does, I think that is much more important. And there I have got, I at least see a light at the end of the tunnel. That's your answer to your first question. I don't know whether because your uh, question was very, very good with some uh, the second question, especially with some amount of philosophical, uh, what I say, color undertoning or underpinning. And when you mention about Bhagadatta, Narkasura, and you also know about Prajyotishpura, why it is called Prajyotishpura, how the, the name of Kamrupa came, how the name of Assam came during that Minhas, Mirjumla's time, how Assam was used in uh, by Hongkordev as a community. Kirata Kosari, Khasi Garumiri, Jobono Konko Gual, Ohomo Muluko, Rojoko, Turuko, Kubaso, Mleso Sondal. Assam was not a land at point of time during Concordia's time. It was it was used to define a community, maybe the home community. So over a period of time, then Hudjokori Doibogo, 18th century Dorong, in uh, in his uh, historical accounts, he started using Assam to denote this land. Then came the British, the Hamilton's account and other accounts of other Britishers. Gradually, in popular imagination and consciousness, the name of Assam identifying this geography gets 
very very entrenched and gets very very intense strong and when we talk about assam and dr fukon also initially while introducing she was telling the land of red river and blue hills and all and when you talk about red river and blue hills as a famous book by hemborua the famous parliamentary and poet he also talks about what you have hinted at very beautifully about assam being a place where people talk about myths and tradition and legacy of different kind of hues and different colors where you will find some amount of astrology astronomy yogini tantra kalika purana and other things will come so definitely my as a student of history i always try to go by what is there in the historical accounts provided it tells me from one or two more sources but once it is there in legends or in other uh, what you call mythological literature then it can gives you unalloyed joy it can gives you tremendous amount of pleasure but at the same time to derive to come to a conclusion about a particular issue based on mythological literature i think it is it is it is something fraught with lot of dangers and that danger i personally feel i don't know uh, we may share almost the same name or the surname but you may not agree with me that that is fraught with lot of dangers and uh, i i just leave it to you because i think the part of your second question also contains an answer and that is the beauty of your question the question itself is pregnant with some amount of answer that might be striking you that might be there in your mind i request you uh, later on also i don't know how much time we have now uh, but later on also you are most welcome uh, you can chat with me you can whatsapp me you can write to me email by taking my email id from dr nilakshi i would love to engage with you and I mean, maybe i think at leisurely we can have a philosophical debate about the myths and histories and other things and good to see you smiling break you. your smile absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> someone breaking into smile when a youngster breaks into smile i feel the world is at safe place that's my last slide to you. you i will contact you thank you so much yeah 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 the dipali dipali has a question related to poetry hena yes uh so i oh. joined this call in like halfway cuz i couldn't join when it first started um so i may have missed this in the presentation but i had a question about the assam literature and just like I guess just like some names and some names of famous poems as well as uh famous authors and just kind of like what the main messages were from like each story or each poem and things like that. So Robert this is the last question I'm asking you. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Would, you, uh, would you would you uh, uh, Nilakshi would you like to paraphrase actually what she basically was looking for uh Uh, sure. Uh, so she just wanted to know more about a little bit of Assamese literature. What are some mm -hmm. names of famous poems as well as pop okay, okay, okay. authors? So okay, okay, okay. About about poems, yeah, 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 yeah. They say na poetry is the criticism of life and poets. I I envy uh, Dipali. I envy all the poets. I myself have not been. Although I wrote sixteen books and very articles almost day in and day out. i envy the poets because i i just envy their capability to play with words and give a message such a wonderful message to humanity and poets can straddle different worlds the oriental world and the occidental world and without much effort they can do that that's why my hats off to the poets if you talk about the modern poets see medieval poets to shankardev was a poet madhavdev was a great poet Okay, Nam Ghoka, Nilakshi would be knowing how it. All Assamese households will find some of those things are poems only. In modern day, also first when we talk about how Assamese uh, became important after the American Baptist missionaries helped us, we come to know about Hemsundra Goswami, who was the first Troika Triumvirate who were based in Calcutta for their education and wrote the first sonnet, Priyatamar Sithi. Then Sundra Kumar Agarwala. So then Lakshminath Besboro was not a I'll not say he was not a poet of that order despite his being the most important exponent and doyen of doyen of Assamese literature so Hemsundra uh, Gustami who is one Sundra uh, Sundra Kumar Agarwala Raghunath Choudhury Anand Sundra Agarwala Jyotindranath Duora then in the present times also we lost them only a couple of years back few years back Hiran Bhattacharya Nilamani Fukon is still present there are many poets sexually and they have beautified our canvas they have beautified our thought process and that's why i said 
maybe on a lighter vein initially that poets can definitely enrich and they can make make me envious and jealous of their wonderful capability to give a very important message in a very brief way in a very poetic way so to end i think uh, dipali may not be able to i don't know to what extent you will be able to appreciate uh, i just want to uh, since you was talking about poem and all and i also talked about uh honkor dev to a great extent maybe 10 minutes 12 minutes on him i would like to end this uh with a particular poem of four lines on honkor dev written by jyotindranath duora uh and that that was uh boala bhaktir khud dila dharma dila gyan boala bhaktir khud dila dharma dila gyan dila bhasha ahomi korila jibon dan তোমার জীবনী দেব লিখে এনে সাধ্যকার গোটেই জীবন জুড়ি বিস্তৃত গোটেই জুড়ি বিস্তৃত জীবনী যার সো দিস ইজ সাম সর্ট অফ পয়েটিক ট্রিবিউট ডান বাই জ্যোতিন্দ্রনাথ ডুয়রা হু ইজ দা ফার্স্ট রেসিপিয়েন্ট অফ সাহিত্য একাডেমি এওয়ার্ড ফ্রম আসাম হি রোট এবাউট শ্রীমন্ত শঙ্করদেব and he was simply astounded how i can write your biography everywhere every part of assam some slice of your legacy your contribution lies that's why he said the bhaktir khud bola bola bhaktir khud dila dharma dila gyan dila bhasha ahome korila jibon dan you have brought in life you have injected life to the mother of assam and more more khadyakar i don't have the audacity i don't have the capability to write a poetic tribute to you because your whole life is strewn over or your whole life is seen over different places of a sand this is how a poet can write and this is how a man like lesser mortal like moyur bora can only envy but i cannot do that but even then to such a lesser mortal uh, nilakshi fukan is kind enough to have invited me for a class and what i what a kind of beautiful questions the students and uh, gyanam mahajan asked i think we are very very uh i was personally very very happy it deeply touched me and i wish all the people who are associated with this particular uh what you call studies in world literature with special emphasis on hindi urdu and all and the people who are associated with that i wish them a great time and i wish all the young students a very what i say very vibrant wonderful colorful future mm-hmm. thank you nilakshi Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Moir, uh, Moir <laughs> so we are going to stop it right here. Thank you, Dipali, uh, for joining. You know? Thank you. And thank you, Bob. Uh, we extended more than half an hour. <coughs> uh, um, okay. uh-huh. So I'm going to stop it right here. And Moir. Uh, uh, I just want to say thank you to Bob Klein. I, uh-huh. i just because i never knew why because i was doing all the talking and all and in the process i might have give gave him lot of pain lot of uh, embarrassment and inconvenience rather that will be the right word so i uh, tell bob not to my because of this exciting questions that we students were asking i think we had to overstretch it by half an hour and thank you once again to north carolina state university bob klein and most importantly last but not the least nilakshi fukan thank you uh, mayur uh, i cannot hear you oh khuna nai niki you can't hear me oh thank you thank you very much yeah thank you i'm just thanking you uh, yeah thank you uh uh-huh. see you then uh uh-huh. bye, bye namaste uh uh-huh. namaste <laughs>